Everybody else has come up just be like. That's such a big window. That's a big window. That is big. No, that is big. I know. I can't see that. Yeah. yeah. That's why like somebody okay, got these at the hotel. <laughs> Oh, well, I've been sitting in the car for a week. And, oh, okay. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. That was just a big window. He did remind me of a story. You just told me a story. I've forgotten what it was. Okay. Hi, Mark. Hey. Oh, it's warm in here. It is warm. I don't want to say we dodged the bullet on that one. No, it's fine. It's no, fine. Don't, 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 don't move it. We don't have to thaw out of the mail. I said, wait five minutes, and they'll turn it off. <laughs> One of the biological differences that proves that there's male and female. There you go. What? Because you we guys are don't get cold about cold a temperature. Oh, I get cold. <laughs> cold 24 seconds. Put that in there. 
Why don't we say, well, we use this much gold, we use this much silver, we had this much of all these things that went into the tower. Why don't we get that? Makes us aware that he's aware of what we do, for one thing. Do what? Makes us aware. Yeah, us aware that he is aware of every little detail. For one thing, what we're doing on earth is what's in heaven, so we're doing. It's a accountability of obedience. Did you want to say something? I'm, li- I'm listening. Oh, I, I, thought I, I thought I saw that. I have something to say, but I just missed it. I'd say it shows precision in creation. Right. Uh, well, <clears throat> I was going to do a, a, a theme this morning. I decided not to this morning because it was too long. But basically what it was about was uh, all of the weights and measures and so forth and the, uh, the metals used in the uh, tabernacle. Uh, represent uh, atomic weights and prime numbers and uh, you know the, the guy that did this said that you know the gold represented God which was covered everything and the silver which was in between things represented Israel and the brass represented the nations. So God brought Israel to save the world. In other words, they're a lot to the world. In other words, and you know, God came first, then Israel, then the nations. And it, it was it, it was kind of a good say so went into a lot of detail. It would you know, probably put you all to sleep. Who did that? I thought it was interesting. The, the guy's name, he's Chinese. His name was uh, What's Ben me? Tang. It, and I, it's, it's like F E N I E something. The new Tang. T A N G. But he had done this in 2017. Uh, and it was on a, a website called. Uh, Ash Israel, but I couldn't find him listed on their website, and I couldn't find anything else out about him. So I really don't know who he is, what he's done. I just thought it was was interesting that, uh, and, and I've seen other things, you know, the gematria of the of the Hebrew Bible how it ties things together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, y'all know that I was met all the Seven, seven words in the first line of Genesis in the beginning, and the separated word is et, all of them top, which ties the beginning to the end, it was an error. Anyway, those kind of things are things that he went through in the article. So. It's another, we call it, Another evidence in the scripture that God is who he says he is. And and I don't remember the exact number, but it's like the atomic weight of gold was the number of pounds of gold in the in the tabernacle. Something like that. You know, just different things that would that, you know, how can that that can't Poorly. be a coincidence? No. Because they didn't know what the atomic weight was. <laughs> I remember um, when I was a kid hearing Arnold Fruchtenbaum talk about the Bible is not a the Bible is not a book that man would write if he could write it, and it's not a book that he could write if he would write it. If he determined that he that he wanted to, he couldn't do it. Appreciate God is smarter than you. Yeah, yeah, just one point. Well, you know, and it fits in, you know. Y'all may not know who Jordan Peterson is, but anyway, yes. well, anyway, but he talks about the scripture, and he was an atheist. That he started reading the Bible, and after he read it, he started teaching uh, from a uh, he's a people clinical psych- psychologist, 
from their pragmatic viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. He, he's part from, but his view is, his, he says, this book is not of this world. He said, there's things in this book that just cannot happen. He said, it's so cohesive. And he showed that picture, I've showed it before, where it has a, a man painted a picture and he put all the script, the Old Testament scriptures here and all the New Testament scriptures here that are referenced by it and then made colored lines going between them and it paints a, a rainbow of, of colors where they're all kinds of things. And, and his statement was is that the scripture was the first internet. He said because everything is connected. He said if you want to find something so you can look at it and you can find links that everywhere else where it's found. He said he said it was done. He said it was done in the beginning. He said the, the internet was born here. He said that's why we have the the, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said that's all a mixture. But we have the tree of life. He said it's the pure word. And he says if, if you want to find God, he said you need to find the pure word, not the mixture that man is. Kind of interesting. Yes. Okay. Let's join, now let's begin by saying the blessing. We'll let, uh, are you ready? I'm sure I am. Okay, join me. Blessed are you, Lord our God, the King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Lord. And in Hebrew. Okay. <clears throat> and, my, and my favorite beginning proverbs are those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law fight against them. Some translations say strife. In Proverbs 28 9, if one turns away his ear from hearing the poor, even his prayer is an abomination. Yeah. Uh, those, those two statements right there ought to frighten everyone. Yeah. Especially if you put all the thing in there. All scripture. All scripture. Mm-hmm. Okay. So either that counts or all. And, and how do you say Kedukhe, Keduki? Kedukhe. I thought I thought the E I would be Kedukhe. So uh, it's the last reading of the Exodus. Uh, and it's an honor, it was not reviews of the tabernacle and how they were used. Portion goes on to describe the completion of the tabernacle. Similarly, <coughs> conclude with depicting the glory of the Lord entering. Okay. In most years, it's a double portion with the last portion we did, and it's usually I don't spend much time on it because everything's too long. That's not the case this time. So we're going to spend a little, a teeny bit more time. Uh, so since this is the accounting, I have this uh, statement here. It's from John Parsons, but I'll actually allow someone to put it. The goal of the great Sinai revelation. What was the Sinai revelation? It was not to simply impart a set of moral or social laws, but rather to accommodate the divine presence in the midst of the people. In other words, it was God bringing his people to him. That's what he did. He went to Egypt, got his people, brought them into the wilderness, and then <clears throat> surrounded himself by his people, right? So it was it was God bringing his people to him. It says, this is not a, <clears throat> to suggest that the various laws and decrees given to Israel weren't unimportant. What were they? They were reflective of his holy character, right? So, what, what is a what is holy character? The sefirot. Hmm? The sefirot. 
it is set apart. If you sin, you can't come into God's presence, right? Because mm -hmm. sin separates us from God. Yeah. Okay. So he gave his law, mm -hmm. his holy character, so that people would know how to act to come into his presence, how to be to come into his presence. Okay. It's when you're I hate to it's like Alan says. Uh, when he cleanses you from all unrighteousness, it makes it to where you can approach him. But if you sin, then that breaks it. And he says, but if you confess your sin, he's just and will forgive you so that you can come back. Uh, does he like that? No, he, he doesn't like you sinning. But he does, he does like you repenting and not doing it again. You know, it's kind of like children. How many times have I told you not to do that? Life <laughs> you your sin is a sow that turned into a swamp or a dog to a swamp. Yeah, you might do that. I've heard that somewhere. I'm not sure where. Uh, so, what is the central theme of the sacrifice in the in the tabernacle. You have the tabernacle and you have the, the brazen altar and you have the altar and you bring your eye. What What is that for? Restoration. It's for restoration, but it's to show how serious sin is. In other words, what does the scripture say about the forgiveness of sin? There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. That's right. Something has to die. So, were the sacrifices at the at the altar sufficient? No. No. What was sufficient? Sure. Sure. But <clears throat> what was sufficient was that you recognized your sin. You confessed your sin. And you said, I'm not going to do it again. So what what later, like in Samuel, when when uh, Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. And what did what did God say? He said, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your obedience. Mm -hmm. If I have your obedience, these sacrifices don't have to occur. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if, if, if you're in right standing with God and you keep his commandments, then you're in right standing all the time. If we don't read the the scripture, find out what the commandments are, and follow them, then what, what are we doing? We're, we're wasting our time, and God's too. Okay? I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm saying that we have uh, a general, and he's given us our marching orders. You know, it's like in the military. Uh, if you don't follow orders, you don't do good in the military. It's just, it's just not good. I think Chris can, can uh, testify to that. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so, <clears throat> but that's why the heavenly hosts are an army. They're, they're the army that follows God's instructions. And if we're going to be a part of the heavenly host, we need to understand who the general is. Uh, the Talmud says all the world was created for the Messiah. That's in the Sanhedrin 98b. The Apostle Paul had earlier said the same thing. All things were created by him and for him. And in him all things consist. That's in Colossians 1, 16, 17. Indeed, all creation is being constantly upheld by the word of the Messiah's power. It comes from Hebrews 1, 3. Creation begins and ends with the redemptive love of God has manifested in the person of Yeshua our Lord. The Messiah is the center of creation. It's the beginning and the end. And as is written, <clears throat> I am the Aleph and the top. I am the beginning and the end. The first and the last. Uh, for through him and for him all things were made. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Right? Amen. So, uh, the point being is we're finishing up the Exodus. What happened before the Exodus? Hmm? 
Judgment. Went into slavery. Yeah. Judgment. You know, we we don't step back and look at the at the uh, the grand picture. You know, God creates the earth, there's the fall, the, the stuff that goes on. But uh, the whole <clears throat> Bible is written saying, uh, God saying, I have the cure before the disease exists. In other words, when it says Yeshua was sacrificed from the beginning of time, that means that he already knew what was happening. That I'm going to create this, this is what's going to happen, and this is the way I'm going to, to redeem it. Uh, my thought is, is uh, for the longest time was why? Why did it have to be a, a creation, a fall, and a redemption? Twice. Hmm? Twice? Twice. Yeah. Well, what, what is y'all's opinion? What do you think? To show the nature of God. Yeah. To his creation for what? Well, uh, I think that everything that happens that we read about is to teach us. And we'll see it just as just as Ecclesiastes says, we'll see it over and over again. What was will be again. Mm -hmm. So what happened before the Exodus was the Passover. So what what freed Israel from bondage to slavery in Egypt? Faith in the blood of the Lamb. Right. Well, that's the same thing that saves us from bondage to slavery to sin. Faith in the blood of the Lamb. Right. It's the picture. Right. Never change. That's that's not what I'm getting at though. I mean that's that is the picture. That is how it's being performed. But why? Why does that happen? And what does the scripture tell us? Because God wants to dwell with his people. He wants to dwell with his people, but it's kind of like uh, fine gold or, or pure metal. It's refined in the fire. In other words, mm -hmm. he wants the perfect uh, bride. In other words, that's, that's what the whole creation story is about. Is about uh, he wants to be able to look at his bride because according to half <clears throat> he can't even look on evil. That's right. Yeah. But that's what the point being is, is that uh, God is refining his creation for his people. In other words, he's bringing, he wants those, he wants us to understand how important it is to know him through his word and to be obedient. And he says, you know, it's not going to be easy. You know, if Adam hadn't have sinned, everything and, and would have he would have had a kingdom and everybody would have been obedient and all that. We wouldn't be going through this. Maybe if Israel, when they came out, if they believed everything that God told them instead of saying, I wish I had died in uh, Egypt and I wouldn't have to go through this. You know, that was the death nail to that generation when they said, if we'd only died in Egypt, and then in this wilderness. portion here, they say, if we'd only died in the wilderness, you know, they're fixing to go through the wilderness, but they say, if we'd only died in the wilderness, and God says, I'm going to give you what you want. You I'm going to let you die in the wilderness. So, what I'm getting at is, is that they're just going over to their own desire. Right. What I'm getting at is, is well, that one. The, the theme of the scripture, the theme of the Bible, uh, is God's refinement of his people. And it's, everybody has the same opportunity to grasp God and, and to get on board and to, to be his people. You know, it doesn't, from the, the least to the greatest, we all have the same uh, opportunity if, if we just grab a hold of it and, and go. What? We're talking about the metals, we'll go about gold and silver, right. what they represent. 
you've got brass. And brass is a combination of two metals mixed together. Mm -hmm. I just wonder how that ties in with the rest of the story. Well, that also awesome. means serpent. <coughs> very shiny. Looks very like good. Okay. Stuff. Yeah, it's very shiny. Looks like it. Uh, so. It's very temperamental, too, on the fire. On what you were saying, mm -hmm. would you say that God wants us to want to be with Him as much as He wants to be with us? That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Which exactly. is the whole picture He's painting with mm -hmm. self sacrifice. He sacrificed mm -hmm. himself for us. He wants us to sacrifice our soul for him. Okay. See, you just, my last deal was, how did we arrive here? <laughs> how did we arrive here? Because yeah, God said, first seeked us, said. but we have to in turn seek him. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point. If, if we don't, uh, it's a reciprocal relationship. You know, God says, I'm seeking you. Why aren't you seeking me? He wasn't the one that left. I know, Connor. I know. That's what I'm saying. He says, I'm trying to find you. If you will only turn and see that it's me, then we have the relationship. <laughs> Another interesting thing about bronze and brass is because they are combinations like tin and zinc and copper, and all of those things oxidize more easily than, well, I was, gold doesn't oxidize at all. And sand. And sand. sand. No, silica. Silica. So it's, it's, it is like the nations. There's all kinds of mixtures there. Yeah. And it's very temperamental. You try to melt it, the zinc wants to explode out of stuff. It's, it's weird. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm not a metallurgist. <laughs> and, and when you pour it, it wants to, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it, it wants little, to, yeah. little yeah. snowflakes yeah. of, uh, what is it, arsenic. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Floating around. <laughs> so you have to wear a mask. Mm. Yeah. The, with with manganese bronze, that's what's in it. That's wanting to come out, mm -hmm. and so they're just yellow zincs, and so people put those on their boats, and it just corrodes the zinc right out of it. Mm -hmm. But if they use an alloy that is higher in um, the so, copper or copper and nickel, then those are the ones that really endure, yeah. and we use those on the aircraft carriers. Cool. Wow. Well, in art, we use the silicon bronze. I think I'm about the only one that really doesn't cor uh, other from gold or pure that doesn't corrode almost at all seawater and whatnot, right? <laughs> but you can only get titanium on my ship. Okay, the tour portion. Uh, we start out the accounting of the materials, the uh, making of the vestments for the priesthood. All the work is completed. The tabernacle is erected and equipped and installed. And the, and, and the clouds of glory fill the tabernacle. Right? And the, the ending theme is uh, the work is completed. So, uh, you see the same theme in, in creation. On the, on the sixth day, he completed his work and then he rested. This is the completion of the Exodus from. <laughs> and so what's the next stage? It's it's the wilderness. And why is the wilderness important? It's a test. Yeah. yeah. The test was is are you can this generation didn't go, your children are the ones that are gonna take the land, right? And you know, are your children gonna be able to? So what was the challenge? to the, the current generation when, when God said, we're going to stand in the generation, we're going to stand in the wilderness to you all that, and then your children will get to take the land. What was the challenge? School. Train them up the way they should go. School. Right. That generation had to make sure their children was able to take the land. Mm -hmm. Were they successful? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, do <coughs> you think that, and I never realized this before, but that generation, though they didn't get to go, rose to the occasion to make sure their children went. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like immigrants come to the United States and they say, well, we didn't have very good, we had to work real hard. So that our children, when we got here, they knew what to do. You know? And then a lot of those children didn't have the moxie of their parents. And 
their fallen generation wasn't good. If you look at what happens, it says, when you get to Joshua, at the end of Joshua, it says, when that generation died out, apostasy entered, and that's when Israel started to fall, and we go through the, uh, the judges and the disciples. Mm-hmm. That first generation, mm, they were good. When, when they died out, the next generation started the judges. So, the first generation actually equipped the second generation, but the second generation didn't equip the next generation. They were still and that's, that's where we are. That's, and, and people don't teach that to your, your, their children. They need to say, the reason I'm teaching you this is so when you have kids, you will pass it to them. And if you don't pass it to them, all is lost. And that's, that's the truth. That's why the work isn't completed. That's why we have to, uh, if we don't tell the next generation, if you don't do this, all is lost. You know, we we must do. And that's one of the I don't know, to me that's one of the most important things because I see I see how I've messed up my life and not knowing this and not passing it to my to my children in the proper way. I don't know how else to say it. Good way to say it. Uh, okay. One difference than that, I'm just going to read the whole core portion, then we're going to discuss it at the end. We're not going to, I'm not going to stop and ask questions. I'm going to have questions, but it's pretty short. Okay. That would require us to pay attention to. Okay. okay. We'll say, we'll, we'll let you, we'll let, we'll give you a break. I know your attention span is way better. It's your <laughs> this is the inventory for the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony that was recorded at Moses' command. It was the work of the Levites under the direction of Hithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Batziel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Yehuda, made everything that the Lord commanded Moses. With him was Oholiab, son of Aishnah, of the tribe of Dan, a gem cutter, a designer, and an embroiderer with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. All the gold of the presentation offering that was used for the project and all the work of the sanctuary was 2,193 pounds, according to the sanctuary shekel. The silver from those of the community who were registered was 7,544 pounds, according to the sanctuary shekel. Two fifths of an ounce per man, that is half a shekel according to the sanctuary shekel, from everyone 20 years old or more who had crossed over to to be registered, crossed over to the registered group, 603,550 men. There were 7,500 pounds of silver used to cast the brass of the sanctuary and the basis of the veil, 100 bases, from 7,500 pounds. 75 pounds for each base. With the remaining 44 pounds, he made the hooks for the post, overlaid their tops, and supplied bands for them. The bronze of the presentation offering totaled 5,310 pounds. He made with it the basis for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the bronze altar, and the bronze grate, all the utensils for the altar, the basis for the surrounding courtyard, the basis for the gate of the courtyard, the tent pegs and the pack. For the tabernacle and all the tent pegs for the surrounding courtyard. They made specifically woven and they made specifically woven garments for ministry in the sanctuary and the holy garments for Aaron from the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Okay, one, two, Basiel made the teapot of gold, the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and a finely spun linen. They hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut threads from them to inter- interweave with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and the fine linen in a skillful design. They made shoulder pieces for attaching it. It was joined together at its two edges. 
the artistically woven waistband that was on the ephod with one piece with the ephod, according to the same workmanship of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and the finely spun linen, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they mounted the onyx stones, surrounded with gold filigree settings, engraved with the names of Israel's sons, as a gem cutter engraves a seal. He fastened them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the Israelites, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also made the embroidered breast piece with the same workmanship as the ephod of gold, the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and the finely spun linen. They made the breast piece square and folded double, nine inch long and nine inches wide. They mounted four rows of gemstones on it. The first row was a row of carnelian, topaz, and emerald. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. In the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were surrounded with gold filigree in their setting. The twelve stones corresponded to the names of the Israel son, of Israel's sons. Each stone was engraved by the seal of one of the names of Twelve tribes. They made braided chains of pure gold cord for the breastpiece. Breast piece. They also fashioned two gold filigree settings and two gold settings and attached the two rings to, the t- to its corners. Then they attached the two gold cords to the two gold rings on the corners of the breastpiece. They attached the other ends of the two cords to the two filigree settings and in this way attached them to the two <coughs> gold shoulder pieces in the front made two other golden rings and put them at the two other corners of the breast piece on the edge that is next to the inner border of the ephod. They made two more gold rings and attached them to the bottom of the ephod's two shoulders. Shoulder pieces on its front close to its seam above the ephod's woven waistband. Then they tied the breast piece tied the breast piece from its rings to the rings of the ephod with a cord of blue yarn so that the breast piece was above the ephod's waistband and did not come loose from the ephod. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. <clears throat> they made the woven robe of the ephod entirely of blue yarn. There was an opening in the center of the robe like that of body armor with a collar around the opening so that it would not tear. They made pomegranates of finely spun blue, purple, and scarlet yarn on the Lord end of the road. They made bells of pure gold and attached the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the road between the pomegranates. A bell of pomegranate alternating all around the lower hem of the road to be worn for ministry. They made it just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the tunics of fine woven linen for Aaron and his son. They also made a turban of the ornate headbands of fine linen, the undergarments and the sash of finely spun linen of their bordered blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They also made a medium I mean, medallion, the holy diadem, out of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving on a seal, holy to the Lord. Then they attached a cord of blue yarn to it in order to mount it on the turban, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So all the work of the tabernacle and <coughs> the tent of meeting was finished. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. <coughs> then they brought the tabernacle to Moses. The tent with all its furnishings, its clasps, its planks, its crossbars, and its posts and bases. The covering of the ram skins, dyed red, and the covering of the manatee skins, the veil for the spring, the ark of the testimony with its holes, and the mercy seat, the table all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its lamps arranged in all its utensils, as well as all the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the spring for the entrance to the tent, the bronze altar with its bronze gates, its poles, and all its utensils, the basins with its stands, the hangings on the courtyard, its posts and bases, the screen for the gate, and the courtyard, its ropes and its tent pegs, and all the equipment for the service of the tabernacle. 
the tent of meeting, and the specifically woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. The Israelites had done all the work according to everything the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected all the work they had accomplished. They had done just as the Lord commanded. Then Moses blessed them. The Lord spoke to Moses, You are to set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Put the ark of the testimony there and spring off the ark through the veil. Then bring in the table and lay out its lay out its arrangement. Also bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar for incense in the front of the ark of the testimony. Put up the screen for the entrance to the tabernacle. Position the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Assemble the surrounding courtyard and hang the screen for the gate of the courtyard. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle with everything in it. Consecrate it along with its furnishings so that it will be holy. Anoint the altar and burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar so that it will be especially holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Clothe Aaron with the holy garments, anoint him and consecrate him so that he can serve me as a priest. Have his sons come forward and clothe them in tunics. Anoint them just as you anointed their father so that they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will serve to inaugurate a permanent priesthood for them throughout their generations. Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. The tabernacle was set up in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month. Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases, positioned its planks, inserted its crossbars, and set up its posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses took the testimony and placed it in the ark and attached the poles to the ark. He set the mercy seat on top of the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle put the veil for the screen and screened off the ark of the testimony just as the Lord had commanded him. Moses placed the ta- table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil. He arranged the bread on it before the Lord just as the Lord had commanded him. He also put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and he set up the lamps before the Lord just as the Lord had commanded him. Moses also installed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the veil and burned fragrant incense on it just as the Lord had commanded. Then number seven. He put up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then he placed the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered the tent, offered the burnt offering and the grain offering on it just as the Lord had commanded. <coughs> He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put the water in it for washing. Moses, Aaron, and his sons washed their hands and feet from it. They washed whenever they came to the tent of meeting and approached the altar, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Next, Moses set up the surrounding courtyard for the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate to the courtyard. So Moses finished the work. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on him, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Israelites set out wherever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. So, just on that reading, what stuck out to y'all as I was reading? What was the most repeated phrase? As the Lord commanded Moses. 
So they did it just as the Lord commanded Moses. And Moses did it just as the Lord commanded him. I don't see how he could carry the ark by himself, though. Yeah. Set up all that stuff by himself. Moses did it by himself. I don't think so. <laughs> I think he's uh, the, the, the Levites did it. Artisans of people did this. I think, in my opinion, they were supernaturally given this vision by the Lord to do what they do. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine doing all this metal work out in the middle of the wilderness. And engraving on the stones. Yeah. Metal 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 one of the things that stuck out was the, the fact that the bells on the bottom of their robes were pure gold. Pure gold does not make a sound that man can hear. So the <clears throat> fallacy of the story that we hear that they had a rope tied to their leg and when they died in there, they, they couldn't hear the bells ringing anymore so they knew the guy died and they pulled him out. They didn't hear the bells anyway because they didn't make any noise. Only God could hear them. Yeah. Well, and, and what's the other thing? It was pomegranate, gold bell, pomegranate, gold bell. Mm -hmm. What does the pomegranate represent? The commandments. The commandments. Mm -hmm. Do you know why it re represents the commandments? 613 arles. The arles inside the pomegranate, there's 613. The seeds? The seeds, mm -hmm. the arles. There's 613 yeah. seeds inside the pomegranate, which mm -hmm. equates to the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And so they had the, te the, the commandments and the gold bell. The commandments and the gold bell. The pure gold are pure like the commandments. Mm -hmm. you, you see the symbolism? Mm -hmm. Now i got to cut and one out of the they In those, and it says the bells and the pomegranates were so that the priest would not die. You know, you, you say this. He said, "I will hear the bells, and and the priest will not die." Mm -hmm. But he's bringing with him on the hem of his garments the commandments and the pure gold, mm -hmm. the, the purity of God, into the presence. And only he could do that one time a year. And what were you going to say? Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose it was down there by his feet? Yeah. So that's how you walk. Yeah, that's how you walk. That's good. I was. Reading that going, okay, he was told to make two cherubim. Well, how did he know what a cherubim looked like? Exactly. You know? If, if, it was according to the vision that he had given Moses. Yeah, the so then Moses had to relay that to Betzal <laughs> to be able to do that. And how did they do that? Get out the pencil and paper? You know, it's just kind of like that's another supernatural thing yeah. that had to have been done. Yeah. I mean, even with Betzal, I mean, the, was Betzal really a teenager? Was he really 13, 14 years old and, and to be given the, the knowledge of the master craftsman of, of not only metal, but how to cast the metal, how to how to, how to hammer the metal? I mean, yeah. all those different things. I mean, that, that is amazing. And even his name, uh, the shadow of God, mm -hmm. that's the same word where it's given the image. And it's the, it's that it's, it's, is if, we as mankind, or he as a as a child, was the shadow of God's presence on the earth. And it's just like that kind of relates what Jesus said. He just did what he saw, saw his father doing. Right. I did the things that my father did. Uh, the stones that were represented. Uh, do you think? Well, diamonds and rubies and emeralds are so beautiful. Why did I all of that? Well, onyx and stuff like that. When you look at under a black light, it's really quite pretty. Mm -hmm. So maybe I see something different than what you see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, <coughs> <coughs> it's kind of like I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, You know, when a, when a plant grows, when, when any, any life starts, it, it starts from a seed. And all the instructions for the plant, or for the animal, or for a human, is in that seed. All the instructions in, from that seed grows a person, 
or grows a plant or grows a tree, where all from the instruction. And uh, what are the instructions? No, no answer. What are, what are the instructions? DNA. The DNA. Hmm? DNA. Right, but it's not the DNA. What what is what is the DNA represent? It's kind of like it's the building plans, the engineering drawings. You're getting close. <laughs> and the instruction <laughs> manual yeah. and the machines that make it. Well, no, you're getting close. What it is? It's words. Oh. It's words. Everything, just like if you, if you write a computer program, you are writing words. The marine. Yeah. In other words, when, when you give a list of instructions, it's, a, it's words. Easy. Yeah, and if you, if you, uh, uh, it, it's really amazing. I, when, you, when you write software, you're actually telling the computer system to do something. You know, take this, add this, move this here, get this, perform this function. It, it's all words, and uh, and you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. The simpler you make it, uh, the easier it is to maintain. The more complex you make it, the harder it is to maintain it. But if you make it complicated, then if something happens to you, the next person that comes along and has to maintain it is sunk. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the best programmers are the ones that do things in the most simple methods. It might, might take more steps, but if someone comes behind you, they can see what you did. That's what that's what God does. Is He teaches us in the most simple format, so that we can see what He's doing and not be confused. Y'all, y'all see that? We had programs at Boeing <clears throat> that were Unix based, and two of the two two programs within the in the larger function of things we could get into this program and you could go backwards and forwards and you could search within it and it was great to use you logged into the other one and you could if you and it would have like 50 60 150 pages and if you went past the page that you wanted to be at you had to go back through all of them to get back to it you couldn't go there was it was just poor and they couldn't do any maintenance to that one because they didn't have they didn't write an outline of how they were going to write the program so they could just go in and, and modify it. Yeah. That's to me is what you're, you're reminding me of a, yeah. a well written program and yeah. not well written program. And well, but if you think about it, if, if we're written, if, what, what makes us people, what makes the world the world <coughs> is words. God spoke to everything. I mean, <coughs> his word is in us when he, when he said he created the, the plants the fish, the birds of the air, when he created us, he spoke us into existence. I mean, we're not made from nothing. We're made from God's word. In the beginning, we are physically his words. Everything is physically God's word. Physically. That's what it is. It's his words. His word is what? Hmm? Life. His word is life. Life. It is life. It's life. His word is his. It's his instructions, which is what the word Torah means, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So whenever you put instructions together, and whatever it is is all the instructions, it starts to disintegrate or fall apart. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the same thing where Alan was hit on today. Whenever something doesn't follow the instructions, it doesn't serve its purpose. And when it's no longer mm -hmm. serving its purpose, that is raw, that is evil, mm -hmm. and disregard. Right. Yeah, that's my example of a clay pot. If it's broken, it's evil because it cannot function. And that's what ha that's what happens to man when we're broken. We cannot fulfill our function. Mm -hmm. We have sin. We're broken. If we confess our sin, we are restored to righteousness. 
and then we can fulfill our function. Mm -hmm. But if we're not willing to repent and turn from sin, we are permanently broken. You can be glued that together with wax. But if you are, it's what's called Sarah in it, and if you are sin Sarah, sin Sarah, you're without wax, you're not glued together, you're actually whole and pure. Right. We're not stuck together? Not stuck together with the appearance of wholeness. Uh, so, on the breastplate, how many stones were there? Twelve. 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 And what was written on them? Names. Names. And why, why is it important? The names are close to his heart. Well, right. Revelation 21 it tells you mm -hmm. what those gates are and what they represent. The stones. Right. Right. I understand that, but why is it important? I mean, why did he make the breast piece and put the names on it, put it over the heart, and put it on the shoulders? The same names. The same names. Different order. Right. But but why why is that important? Show that he is carrying them, that he is taking care of them. That they are close to his heart. He's going to give them to them. Yes, all, all those things, all those things are true. But, but go ahead. No, no, I had all that there. I was waiting for the but. <laughs> <laughs> he's, waiting, he's waiting for the but Paul. But, but no, the, the thing is, is that he says, if you will come to me, I have my children. You know, the, the priest has them on his heart mm -hmm. and carrying them on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. If you come in to me with them, you're in the same place that they are. In other words, they were to be a light to the nations. And then the high priest said, See, I carry all my tribes on my breastplate. I have them close to my heart. I have them on my shoulders. God is inviting us to join his people. Okay? He said, I chose Abraham <coughs> that his descendants would be a light to the nations. Okay? So his whole purpose was to build a nation to save the world. That nation was first, and we are all grafted into that nation because we have to see God through his people. Okay, so he came to his people to save his people to save us, right? And so th that's the picture of his salvation. He's saying, "I, God, have uh, chosen my people, and I've chosen my leaders, and that they are to bring you in." through what I am teaching them. And so, if they don't get it, they can't pass it to us. My, my opinion is, is one of the greatest things in history, of all history, is that the uh, Jewish tribes, the, what, whatever was left of um, uh, Israel that has been maintained in the world, whether they're Jew, Jews or uh, Benjaminites, whatever, whatever tribes were left in Judah when it was finally dispersed, have been a cohesive group for the most part and have preserved the Hebrew scriptures for thousands of years. Amen. Literally. And if they hadn't have done that, there would be no light. We would just be bumping around in the darkness. What? And they were not kicked out of the covenant. No. They were not divorced. Israel was divorced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is is that that's an amazing thing, a truly amazing thing. I mean, in, in all of history, when they go back and find pieces of the scripture, it is you know 99% the same as what we have today. They, I mean, they have found differences, but they're immaterial. Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's that's crazy insane. But they still haven't found any of that, that ancient in English. 
Yeah, we're still looking for <laughs> But you're still trying to find Paul's version of the King James? <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'm going to go on now. Uh, <laughs> now, the other, thing, the other thing that gets me, uh, you know, in all of the Torah study, when you're coming down to the Exodus, the number of people. You know, if you, if you watch the movie, the old movie, uh, Charleston Heston, his mother, Ten Commandments, yeah. yeah. Uh, did they do a pretty good job of showing the number of people? I think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it looks like a lot. I don't think... Huh? You got three and a half? You got almost four hours? No, I have to. Well, what I'm getting at is... There's four and a There's what, a couple hundred thousand people living in Amarillo. Yeah, 200,000. 200,000. 200, mm-hmm. What if we just got everybody in town and said, let's go on a camping trip, and we just we just started walking out of town together <laughs> with our backpacks? That's just 200,000 people. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's 10% of what wow. they say. It'd be like herding cats. Billy Glenn. Billy Glenn would love it. Yeah. They just move right in. Well, what I'm getting at is. I is uh, it's the eagle right there. You can't see <laughs> Yeah, we, in our own minds, we have to minimize the story because we can't get the concept of what it really was. Two pe- two million people going through the desert. Yeah, without a flushing toilet and shower. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it wasn't a holiday. I mean, we knew that now for two or three days, and we come back and we're like, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. Some of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us say, when are we going again? I know. Well, I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying it's not fun. I'm saying that we are so not used to it that it, it takes everything out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, while you're doing it, you go, like when we go to Carmichael, it's, it's great fun and you're doing a lot of stuff. But when you get back, you say, yeah, I'm tired. And we're just there for a week. So. You haven't been to Tabernacle since, have you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you were there. You were there. I'm sorry. You were under the tree. I remember that. We're, we're just curious if you broke enough stuff on the ranger to get to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, it's typically not funny. <laughs> My wife was still wondering where the lake is. <laughs> yeah, we were here. We can draw you a picture of where it was. <laughs> So you figure it's the previous year. It was there. First what year. we do is, is we stand over there where the lake was and say, imagine this. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be there there was a premier water skiing lake. That lake would not help too many really? people, though. Yes. <laughs> he was yeah. raised they, had, they had water skiing jumps and all kinds of stuff in that lake. It used to be one of the wow. bigger, more popular lakes. I must have drank. Oh, yeah, it was. <sighs> <laughs> if I did the history though. Meredith used to be much bigger too. I remember Meredith. Oh, so I got I got aircraft story in front of me. We were in a big meeting and what was happening was uh, uh and I can't remember the name, Zodiac, the large company, mm-hmm. was making the life rafts that go inside the B twenty two, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't they they had some problems, got sold or whatever it was, there was a bump in the road. And there wasn't enough for the life raft to go around to supply new production as well as uh, what was going in the fleet and whatnot, right? So one of the questions and the concerns is like, well, when you guys are flying around there in Amarillo, is, it, is, there, is there a body of water that we should have to worry about that? But my, my brain, the way it works, I said, if somebody lands in some water around here and there's water coming in the door, they forgot to put the gear down. <laughs> <laughs> Lakes or now that we have our oh, okay. mm-hmm. What are the two great themes of the book of the Exodus? What are, what are the two great themes? The deliverance from bondage 
and the end of the tour. The revelation of Simon. What is the revelation of Simon? God himself and the Torah. Hmm? God himself and the Torah. Right. God reveals himself yeah. through his word. Yeah. But the deliverance from Egypt was he, he showed them his power. He defeated the gods of this world and he delivered them from bondage. Right? So that's that's the first uh, revelation. I mean, that's the first thing. But then the revelation is he gets to the mountain and he identifies who he is through his words. Okay? He defeated Pharaoh the same way <coughs> with what Pharaoh could understand. The powers of this world. You know, the plagues, the animals, all the things that he did, uh, all the way up to killing <coughs> the firstborn. But when he killed the firstborn, was it just the firstborn of man? No. no. Um, the firstborn of all the all animals. The earth earth. Thing. So he he treated Pharaoh like he needed to be treated, right? But what about the Egyptian people? What was the difference between Pharaoh and the Egyptian people? Pharaoh was, was hardened until the end. And even after the end, he wanted to go get the people and bring them back. What about his people? They, it, it says in the scripture that they liked Israel and they gave them gifts. In other words, mm -hmm. when, they, when God said, you will plunder them, they just said, give them. And they said, oh, we're glad, dude. You know, you, you've done us a favor. You killed mm -hmm. all your people and then you did you a favor. Now that's crazy. Isn't it? You got rid of that tyrant. Yeah. Um, Who wasn't anyway. the firstborn? Yeah. Well, uh, so the point being is, is that when they left Israel, it says they marched out in ranks as an army with their heads held high. That was their, the peak of the story right there. When they were leaving, they, they were kind of a, a cohesive group. Moses has let us out. We're going out. And when they get to the uh, Red Sea, when they're fixing the cross, and they see a little bit of trouble, they see Pharaoh coming up, what do they do? Why have you brought us out here to die? Yeah. I mean, they go from we, our God has saved us, mm -hmm. to they get to the sea, and they've been through all the plagues, they've been through all the stuff that they had. Yeah. Yeah. And they say, well, evidently God didn't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Why did we leave in the first place? He did. Okay. So, also, it also repeats the same story over and over. over. First, first Noah believed. First he found grace. Right. Then he was given instructions and then he obeyed. Right. First Abraham believed. Then he was right. counted him with righteousness as grace. Right. Then he was given instructions. Then he obeyed. Right. The same thing happens here. First they were saved. Then they were baptized. Then they were taken to the mouth to instructions. They didn't get the instructions first. They got them after being saved. Right. Then later on, eventually, the event. Yeah, but it took a long time to get to the goodbye part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, They're still getting to it. The what? The seed. They're yeah. still getting to it. They're yeah. still getting to it. That's true. So are we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's patient. Uh, He'll be patient for him. So, Jewish tradition tends to regard the giving of the law at Sinai to be the goal of the entire redemptive process, a sort of return from exile to the future stature of God's chosen people. The written Torah, however, indicates that the climax of the revelation of Sinai was to impart the pattern of the Mishkan to Moses. In other words, the goal of the revelation was not primarily to impart a set of moral or social laws, but rather to accommodate the divine presence in the midst of the people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
It was to bring God, bring us closer to God, to bring the Jewish people closer to God. But as he just said, what was the real reason? It was for redemption. It was to make a nation that could save the world. It, it wasn't to accommodate the divine presence, even though it did. But that wasn't the purpose. The, the whole purpose of the scripture, the whole purpose of Yeshua is redemption. It's, it's bringing God into our lives and saving the world. It's not... Um, I don't remember who it was. Thank you, Mr. President. Just saw this. Anyway, the, the statement was, is, is that God doesn't need us. You know, he, he's, God is perfectly fine on his own. But he created us and wants us to love him as he loves us. But he doesn't. He doesn't have to have us, does he? No. Not to exist. Not to but exist. he wants relationship. He wants to, like he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Right. He wants to walk with us. And so, the creating and the revelation of the Mishkan was a place in our realm where he could, his presence could dwell and interact with man, which was just a step in the place where our hearts became the place where he indwells and he interacts with man. And woman, and all in the hopes of what is going to happen when his presence can fill the temple in Jerusalem in the future and walk with man. Right. But the thing is, is his presence filled the temple. But the goal is for his presence to fill us. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm hmm. And how does his presence fill us? I, I've told y'all the answer to this before. Through his word. Mm -hmm. If we don't know his word, if we're not familiar with it, uh, I could, if, if you're listening to a radio preacher or something and they start talking about the scripture, and they say something that's absurd. It, I, I listen. So has the radio set to work. These preachers come on in the morning and the alarm goes off and they're they're talking yeah. about stuff. And I, I just talk, I say, you gotta turn that off. That's why it's not a bit so bad. That's right. <laughs> that's it. You gotta go break that radio. Because they're saying stuff, you know, like uh, what you were saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. Our sin is his glory. No, it's not. You know, stuff oh, the like law was nailed to the cross? Yeah, the law was nailed to the cross. The stuff that's, that's crazy. No, sugar no. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that... The uh, dog was nailed to the cross. You know, we're, we're tempted to, to read the Bible as a, as a story and not apply it to ourselves. You know, we're tempted to do that with our children, to read it as a story and not explain it to them what it really means. You know, and uh, I try to do that to uh, grandkids. You know, I try to, I was always confused about knowledge and wisdom and obedience and those things because no one ever told me, you know, knowledge is the word of God. If you have God's word in you, you know things. But wisdom is how you apply that in your life. If you have the knowledge but you don't apply it, you don't have wisdom. All you have is just some useless instructions that you don't know what to do with. But wisdom is to actually apply that word in your life. And, if, and to apply it, you have to teach others about it. And you have to teach your children about it so that they understand what knowledge is and what wisdom is. Uh, because the world is going to tell them their, its wisdom if you don't tell them God's wisdom. But what is the world's wisdom? Foolishness. Foolishness. That's what they see in the Bible. They say it is foolishness. But what does God see it as? 
life. He says, these words that I command you today are your life. They are his love. His love, but they are our life. If you abide in his commandments, which is his word, you abide in his love. John says again. So, uh, slavery, deliverance, revelation, the altar, uh, What are those themes that come out of Exodus? Slavery, deliverance, revelation, the altar. It's the story of salvation, right? The story of salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to be all about, is the story of salvation and restoration. And, uh, we're supposed to be related <coughs> to the Redeemer. Before he can be our kinsman, we should have the same seed and produce the same fruit. Those are his brothers, mother, and sister that hear and do. Hear and do. Yeah. If you hear but you don't do, did you really hear? Nope, nope. And if you hear and you do otherwise, mm -hmm. Matt, Matt 12 50 repeats the same thing that says those who do the will of God are his mother and sisters. It's mm -hmm. the same thing as will, accepting his seed and producing his fruit. Okay. So let's... Then you become a fellow heir as a brother, sister. So what do we say after we read the last verse of the, of the chapter? Kazak, Kazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. So, Calvin's going to explain it to us today. Can you go back one step, one? No. Oh. I just did. Oh, hold on, I'd like to take a picture of that. Mark and Jason, I can. Right now. Well, this is close. Let's see that. Or if I push the button real quick. Okay. You can push the button. Thank you. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. So I see Cal says, what a busy day. Yes. Mom says the roads are pretty clear, so church will probably open again tomorrow at Big Snowstorm. Wow, I wish I'd done my Bible study instead of playing outside all day. Or I wish I'd done it before dinner, after dinner, instead of watching TV or before bed, but now it's too late. The day can really slip by when you're deliberately avoiding something you're supposed to do. <laughs> so, have we been avoiding what we're supposed to do? Okay. Not for the last hour and a half, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And what's Vaika? Leviticus. And he calls. What does Leviticus mean? Lepatitis. The Levites. I don't know what Levi is. Whatever it is said about the Levites. The Levites. It's, it's the instructions for the Levites. Yes. How to be a priest and how to support the tabernacle. Right? It's the it's what's taught to the children first. Right. But why is it why is it taught to the children first? Because it's the basics, right and wrong. Well, and it's also what Christianity is supposed to be about. We're supposed to be a, a nation of priests. We're supposed to be Levites. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in the New Testament. It says, I, I brought you out to be a, a, a they have to learn to do so that they can teach the children to learn to do so that they can teach the children to learn to do. Because we were talking about learning to do it. When you rise up and you sit down and you go out and you come in. Okay. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, Yeshua.
true of our Messiah, our and life everlasting. Stand in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. And Hebrew. Baruch atah, And don't slip on the moss. Slip on the what? Oh, on the wet moss. <laughs> oh, daughters of Zion. Hear the words of your father Hear his promise of love I will make you a blessing So count the stars if you can You will be a great nation I will give you this land I will bring you back home, I'll bring you back home, oh my children, you will no longer roam, lost and alone in the night, there is nothing on earth that could take you away, once I gather Don't fear, oh my daughters, or oh sons of Abraham. I will wash you with water. I will offer the lamb. Though your sins were like scarlet, they'll be whiter. 